Thank you very much. So I welcome everyone um, over the next half an hour. I'll give you a bit of an introduction to leaf mines, very much from a lepidopteran perspective. So the, the format will look a little bit like this, and we'll start off with um, discussing what they actually are, and then where we can find them, when they occur, and then the all important question of how we go about recognising them, and potentially identifying them to species level, what resources you can use to assist you in doing that. Uh, we'll look at a few examples to give you a better idea of, um, of the different kinds of mines and what they can look like. Um, ask why we should actually be interested in recording them and then if anyone's interest has been sufficiently peaked set your little homework challenge to do something that can be achievable right now and leave a little bit of time at the end for some questions if any come up um, on each slide there will be uh, a photograph of an example of leaf mine um, i'm not going to talk about that particular leaf mine um, but it will just give you um, an idea of some different examples, um, what they can look like, build up your knowledge as we go through the talk. Uh, each photograph will be labelled with the species name in italics and the food plant underneath it. So what is a leaf mine? Well, uh, I don't have a dictionary definition. I'm not sure if such a thing actually exists, but um, I sort of have my own pithy sentence to describe them. And, and that is, it's damage caused by a larva feeding within the plane of a leaf. So that's um, not on the upper surface of the leaf, not on the lower surface of the leaf, but actually within the plane of the leaf itself. So leaf planes are around two to 300 microns on average. Um, so by definition, that a larva that can feed within, some, within something that that's that, that narrow is very small. Um, and the imago that eventually emerge from this are uh, also consequently very small. Typical uh, moths that leaf mine are around two and a half to four millimetres in length as adults. So leaf mines form distinctive shapes and patterns, sometimes colour too, and these are critical uh, for the identification, and we'll look at that in more detail a bit further on. Um, it's uh, important to, to note at this stage um, that uh, leaf mines are not just caused by moths, um, they can be caused by the larvae of flies, sawflies and beetles as well. Um, and in fact, actually, it's fly mines which are most diverse in terms of numbers of species. Um, I'm only going to really cover moths in this talk, um, primarily because there is insufficient time to, to look at anything further, um, but also because my, my knowledge really um, focuses very much on them. Um, there's around somewhere around probably about 300 species of moths in Scotland, which uh, whose larvae will, will um, leaf mine. Um, more than that, if you take the UK as a whole, um, there are two main families of moths um, where all the members are in fact uh, leaf miners. That's the Nepticula day and the Gracilaria day. Um, with um, approximately 100 species in each family um, across the whole of the UK. There are a number of other families which are much smaller in terms of diversity or only have uh, some members of the family which are leaf miners. So where can we find them? Well, without being too facetious about it, it's quite literally anywhere where there are leaves. Um, most sort of reasonably well-planted gardens will have some leaf miners in them, or almost certainly you'll have fly mines in your garden, um, but it's quite possible that you'll also have at least one species of moth that's leaf, leaf mining in your garden too. So there's no need to go running out to an ancient oak woodland or an ancient grassland or some kind of um, uh, beautiful natural habitat. Um, you can actually get started anywhere. And in fact, planted environments can actually be rather good. Um, they tend to have unusually diverse assemblages of food plants, particularly trees anyway, um, and that can provide a, a good diversity of species on them. Uh, for instance, I visited Strathclyde Country Park earlier this autumn, um, which is right next to the M74 near Glasgow. Um, it's a completely planted habitat, um, quite unnatural. Didn't look overly promising when I arrived, but uh, within two hours I was able to locate 
around 60 species of moth leaf mines. Um, just to give you an idea of the kind of diversity that can be out there. Ultimately, you would need to go and visit a wide variety of different habitats if you want to record as many different species as possible. Um, but um, to start off with, you don't need to travel that far um, around your village if you're in a more rural area or um, if you're in a more urban area, then um, parks, retail parks, supermarket car parks, motorway service stations, they can all be good places to look. Um, the key thing to take from this is that they're not rare um, and it's not that difficult to actually find them once you've got your eye in. I always recommend probably starting off looking on trees, um, uh, but uh, to, to note also that some species use bushes and smaller plants as well. So when can you find them? Uh, well, quite literally any, any time of the year. Um, the, the beauty of leaf mines versus um, perhaps more conventional methods of recording moths, either searching for adults by day or through light trapping is that you can find them at any time of the year um, and in any weather. Um, although obviously if it's quite windy, finding um, leaf mines on, on leaves that are blowing around a lot can be a little bit tricky. Um, as we move into winter, obviously a lot of trees and plants cut their leaves, but there, there are some evergreen species and there are one or two species of leaf mine which, um, uh, which can be found on these. And through the winter, it's also a good, uh, good time of year to hunt through fallen leaf litter, um, particularly looking for blister mines. So the image here is, is a kind of blister mine. Um, it's a good time of year to find those, particularly um, under oak trees. Um, it's very easy or it's easier to rear the adults from, from fallen leaves because the larvae have already finished feeding. Um, so they don't require any specific conditions and collect them, uh, keep them cool over winter and uh, hopefully some nice adults will emerge in the spring, which you can then identify. As we move into the spring, um, most uh, plants and trees will be developing new leaves and there's a small number of species which um, specialise in feeding in the spring, um, primarily a primitive uh, family of moths called the area crania day. Uh, there's only um, seven or eight species in this family, most of them feed on birch as one on oak. Um, they start feeding from end of April onwards right through into the summer. Um, also in the spring the elechista day, uh, which is a larger family, um, but um, they are a little bit more difficult to identify um, and find, primarily because they feed on uh, grasses, rushes and sedges, um, which are, uh, as a food plant, more difficult to identify. Um, then as we move into summer, what, what happens is the majority of leaf miners have more than one generation in a year. So you tend to have summer generation, autumn generation, some even have more than two generations. The summer generation of most leaf miners is actually relatively small in terms of numbers. Um, and the majority of people who record leaf mines tend not to bother too much for the summer generation. The big advantage of recording the summer generation is collecting the mines and rearing through to adulthood is a lot easier than the autumn generation simply because you don't have to overwinter. Then we move into the autumn, which is the main season. So this begins um, in August effectively and runs right through really till early December when the majority of, um, of deciduous uh, trees and plants have lost their leaves. Um, this is the season when the, the, when the recorders focus their efforts um, and do the majority of their recording time. Um, and the, the absolute peak in terms of species diversity tends to be from sort of mid-September to mid-October. Um, from mid-October onwards, um, the, the, the quite a few species of plants and trees start to drop a sufficient number of leaves that it becomes quite difficult to find uh, leaf mines on those particular um, species. So you've got a rough idea now what you're looking for, um, where you should look, when you should look, um, but how do we go about actually recognising and uh, hopefully trying to identify some species um, right down to species level. Um, so the first and probably most important thing to say is that you have to identify your food plant correctly. Um, if you don't do this, um, it's getting quite difficult, if not impossible, to actually arrive at species level identification. Um, so a, a basic knowledge of uh, food plants is, is really important. 
the next thing is um, people who are starting out recording leaf mines for the first time um, sometimes have a bit of an issue to start off with working out what's a leaf mine and what's some other kind of damage on the leaf, be it surface grazing, bacterial, uh, fungal, um, or even sometimes galls. Um, so there's no hard and fast rules here. And unfortunately for quite a few of the things we're gonna discuss on this slide, there aren't hard and fast rules, but there are some things that you can use to help you. So um, what you can do in, in, the, in the first instance is to hold the leaf up to the light and look through. And um, if you can see what's termed uh, fras, which is essentially um, larval poo, um, that means for sure you've got a leaf mine. If you can't identify any fras um, within the damage you're looking at, um, it may well not be a leaf mine, it may be something else. However, there are some species which are very clever and have evolved mechanisms for actually uh, ejecting the frass out of the leaf mine um, and, and leaving the mine frass free. So there are three main kinds of leaf mine, uh, gallery mines, blotch mines and blister mines. Um, blister mines are very distinctive and they're always lepidopteran. Um, gallery mines and blotch mines can be lepidopteran, um, but they can also be either flies, sawflies, or beetles, as we mentioned earlier. So how do you tell uh, a moth leaf mine away from, e.g. flies, sawflies, and beetles? Again, no hard and fast rules here, um, but if we take, for example, gallery mines, um, what we tend to find with moths is that the mines are what we call full depth, and that is they uh, feed right through the full um, thickness of the leaf. Um, flies tend to feed on one surface of the leaf only, um, so either the upper side or the underside, not, so they're not full depth. And um, when you hold this up, when you hold the leaf up to the light, what you'll see is that uh, a fly mine is a little bit more cloudy, less well defined than a, a, a moth leaf mine. And uh, moths also tend to have one line of frass, whereas flies tend to have two lines. Um, after a while, what happens is you get a bit of experience and you start to realize and start to understand, okay, that's probably going to be a moth, that probably isn't. Um, you, you, it's something that really you can't. Um, you can't substitute experience for. So what I would recommend doing is uh, collecting leaves to take them home for further analysis. Um, trying to identify mines in the field species level is really quite tricky at the beginning um, and not really advisable. Um, you need a hand lens uh, in order to be able to get a bit more magnification to um, assess the details in a mine. Um, and sometimes a, a basic microscope can be really useful as well. So um, you've got to a point now where you, you think you've got a moth leaf mine. Um, so what should you be looking for? Well, um, the shape of the mine, um, the pattern of the frass within it, and sometimes the color of the mine and the frass are all important for the ID. Um, when you examine the mine in a bit more detail, you're looking for things like the position of the egg, whether it's been laid on the upper side or the underside of the leaf, whether it's near the leaf margin, whether it's near the midrib, whether it's along a vein or, or in a vein axle. And if they're present, um, larval and pupil characters can also be really important for ID. So a lot of mines can be identified without the presence of a larva or a pupa, um, but some do require this. And there are some that you also need to actually um, rear the larva through to adulthood in order to be able to ID. And an added layer of complexity is that even some of these then need dissection to get to species level. But the majority can be identified um, without the presence of a larva or a pupa. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, so what we're doing here is we're comparing a moth um, gallery mine versus a fly gallery mine. On the left, Stigmella trimaculella, which is a poplar feeder. Uh, hold the leaf up to the light and you'll see that there's lots of frass in the mine. That's the, the black stuff. Um, the mine is full depth, it goes right the way through the leaf and it's really well defined, very easy to see and, and, um, uh, and identify the patterns there. On the right, Orlochromiza tremulae, which is an aspen feeding fly. When we hold the leaf up to the light, the mine itself is much more difficult to see. It's rather cloudy, uh, indistinct, 
Um, there's limited frass in there and what frass is present, you can just about make out it's in twin tracks, not one single track. So this is a good way of, uh, of comparing or a good comparison um, of moth versus fly, the gala and mines. Um, looking at blotch mines, um, on the right, Fenicella nana, which is a sawfly, um, a large blotch on birch. The frass within the mine is dispersed, randomly placed, um, no particular pattern to it. Also, sawflies tend to be quite large, or the larvas of a sawfly tend to be quite large in comparison to moth larvae. On the left, Ectodemia occultella, which is a moth um, that also feeds on birch. Um, so the frass in a blotch mine um, with, a, with the moths tends to be a bit more organised in some way. Um, in this case, it's forming a blotch within a blotch, so the, the, the frass is sort of a, a central dark blotch within the overall blotch mine. Uh, so it can be sometimes like this, um, or maybe it's piled in one corner of the, um, of the mine, but it, in some way it's usually more organised than you will, you will find for a sawfly. Okay, so we've now got to a point where we are reasonably confident we've identified um, that we have a moth leaf mine. So now we want to try to get to species level identification. So how do we go about this? Uh, the first thing to say is there, there's no um, leaf mine field guide um, on the market. So there are some books that have resources within them, but um, none of them on their own are going to be able to identify all of the leaf mines that you might be able to find in the field. Um, Chris Manley's recently published third edition of the Photographic Guide to British and Irish Moths um, does have some leaf mine photographs in it, um, but it's not a field guide so it doesn't actually tell you how to identify um, the, the mines that are featured. Um, there is also uh, Sterling and Parsons uh, field guide to micromoths of Britain and Ireland, um, which isn't listed on this slide. Um, again, there are some photographs in there of leaf mines, but um, uh, limited information on how to actually identify them. Langmaid, Palmer and Young's Field Guide to the Smaller Moths of Great Britain and Ireland. That's, so this is not a photographic guide or an illustrated guide at all, it's purely text. It does feature every single species of micromoth in the whole of the UK, um, with details on um, all of the different life stages. Um, there are some bits of information in there that might help you to identify um, leaf mines and it is uh, indexed by food plant as well. So it's a useful companion guide, but again, it's not going to be able to give you all the answers that you need. And finally, I've flagged up Ben Smart's excellent Micromoth Field Tips book. Um, so this is laid out in a sort of calendar year format with I think it's 12 species of, uh, of micromoth that you can look for in any given month of the year, including some leaf mines. Um, but it, once again, will, will doesn't, it's not comprehensive and it's not really set out in a way that you can, um, if you've identified your food plant, you can actually work out what species of leaf mine you're dealing with. So what you need to do is go on to the web, to your website, called leafmines.co.uk um, and this is your, your bible as it were. Um, it's, it has keys for identification, um, they are organised by food plant type, so you click on your food plant and then there's a key that will hopefully help you work through um, and come out with either a species level identification or the knowledge that you are, are unable to identify your mind to species level with the information that you have. It's well illustrated with lots of great photographs, it's updated several times a year and there's a newsletter company which you can sign up to. It's a really great website. Um, I've also flagged up UK Fly Mines um, which uh, features all of the moth uh, leaf miners as well as all the flies, saw flies and beetles as well. Uh, again there is a key and it's searchable by food plant um, it's not quite as user friendly if you're specifically looking at moths only, um, but what's useful if you have identified your food plant, you have your, uh, your leaf mine on it, you think that it's a moth but you can't find it on the leaf mines website, it's worth then reviewing um, UK fly mines because perhaps it wasn't actually a moth leaf mine after all and you may be able to get to a species level identification um, of either the fly or the sawfly or the beetle. 
Finally, I've mentioned social media. There's an excellent Leaf Minds group on Facebook. Um, some of the people on there are behind uh, the Leaf Minds website. Um, you can get lots of assistance and support um, in your quest to identify your minds. So just to show you a few examples um, and show you, uh, teach you a little bit of terminology. On the left, we have Stigmella oxyacanthella, which is uh, largely on hawthorn. Um, but also we'll use things like apple and pear as well. So the mind starts in the bottom right of the image. Um, uh, it's very narrow to begin with, following the vein along. Um, it's with a facet of what we call linear to begin with, um, but shortly after the start of the mind, uh, it widens out and the frass becomes what we call coiled. Um, it's in the form of a coiled spring. What happens here is the, the rear end of the larva wiggles back and forth as it's feeding and produces this particular pattern. On the right, we have Stigmala svensoni, which is a rare oak feeding gallery miner. Uh, in this mine, um, you can see the frass is um, what we call dispersed. So it's in individual grains um, forming a central band um, through the middle of the mine. Um, I also flag up when you're looking at gallery mines, it's worth noting whether the uh, frass extends all the way to the edge of the mine or whether it leaves what we call a clear margin. It can be useful um, in your identification. A couple of examples of blotch mines on the left, Area Cranius Barmanella, which is one of the uh, spring feeders on birch, which we mentioned earlier. Um, the, this particular family have rather distinctive um, frass, which is in this kind of long thread-like um, uh, appearance. Um, on the right, we have Ectodemia alba fasciata, which feeds on um, uh, deciduous oaks. Um, and in this case, the, the frass is neatly piled up um, in one corner of the mine. It's also worth flagging up here that the blotch mines, um, they often, uh, the mine will begin with a short gallery to, to start with. So with Ectodemia alba fasciata, if you look carefully, you can see um, on the, the lower uh, of the two mines there, um, if you follow it up from the top left of the mine, or the blotch, should I say, along the vein, you'll actually see where the mine starts. And then it follows the vein downwards and it gets to a point where it then opens out into the final blotch. So blotch mines can be kind of hybridised gallery to start with, blotch um, to, be, to finish. And um, also sometimes the blotch can subsume the initial gallery, uh, rendering it very difficult to see. List of mines. Um, so these are, as I said earlier, these are always moth, um, never fly, saw fly. Um, what you normally notice with the blister mine is you'll, you'll see the upper side first um, and what you look for is a bit of discoloration um, and usually some contortion of the leaf. Now when blister mines are very young, um, the colour change is limited as is the distortion. Um, turn it over and then you'll see the mine there on the underside. Um, and some of the things you're looking for um, when you're trying to identify your blister mine is the overall shape. Is it sort of um, rounded and short or is it lo uh, long, narrow and, and, um, uh, and slim? Um, is it rounded, elongated? Um, what is the, the amount and the orientation of the contortion of the leaf? Uh, how many creases are there on the underside? Um, is it uh, uncreased, is there one single central crease um, or are there many creases? Uh, the overall length can be worth measuring um, and the position within the leaf, is it uh, at the midrib, is it contained between veins, um, is it away from the midrib um, and occasionally there are um, useful colour indications as well. Um, here are a couple of upper surface only mines um, which don't fit the normal rules, as it were. Tichiria eclabadella on the left, which as you can see is an oak feeder. Um, so this is a blister mine, um, but it's upper surface rather than lower surface. Um, upper surface blister mines tend to have a sort of white, um, filmy appearance. There's four mines on that particular leaf. And on the right, we have Phyllocnistus unipunctella. So this is unusual in that it's an upper surface only gallery mine. Um, there are only three species that do this in the UK, and this is the only one in Scotland. It's uh, a localised black poplar hybrid feeder. Um, the galleries are, are relatively translucent and actually not that easy to see, but what you, what you end up with is these kind of um, whitish snail trails that run around on the leaf. Um, many of you may well be familiar already with the concept of green islands. 
Um, so it used to be thought that um, it was in uh, something that the moth larva itself did um, in order to um, uh, keep a, a small area of the leaf alive. But it's recent uh, studies have shown that in fact it's actually a symbiotic relationship with bacteria which are encouraged to live on the body of the moth itself. And the bacteria interact with the tissues of the leaf and also the production of cytokinins. Um, so in the leaf, uh, cytokinins normally inhibit the leaf senescence so they, um, they stop it from, um, from dying. Um, so when the plant switches into its dormancy mode, what, what normally happens is cytokinin production shut down. Um, but in the case of these bacteria, they're actually able to ramp up the cytokinin production just in a small area of the leaf tissue that's around the moth larvae. So what you end up with is this small region or an island as it's called um, of leaf tissue which has a prolonged photosynthetic life and this uh, gives the opportunity for uh, larvae which feed late in the autumn um, to, to have food for a bit, bit longer than they would do otherwise. Um, a couple of examples here, Ectodemiaja repisa on aspen can be really numerous. Um, you can find hundreds if not thousands of these uh, fallen on the ground under aspen groves. Uh, and Stigmella titivella, which is a bit more widespread species on beach. Um, and at the moment, these mines are really quite easy to spot. The, the green islands show up really well in the leaf litter underneath the trees. Uh, very briefly mention a couple of honorary miners. Um, so there are two genera in the family Gracilaria day, Peronyx and Caloptilias. They actually do both start off as uh, gallery miners. They have very, very short gallery mines before the larvae exits the leaf. These gallery mines are very rarely recorded and very difficult to find. But once they exit the leaf, they free feed underneath a folded over um, corner of the leaf. Usually, quite often it's a lobe. Um, but they're quite um, distinctive fold, uh, folds on the leaf margin. And um, the, so the moth larvae is feeding, free feeding on the surface, but underneath a fold. And we record them at the same time of the year as uh, leaf miners. Um, so they sort of end up almost being honorary miners effectively. And the other one is the Caliophora family, quite a large family of species, which um, uh, create a, a case the larvae lives within, usually made from uh, fragments of the food plant. Um, they sometimes also have a short gallery mine at the start of their life before they exit to form the case. Not always the case though. Uh, and when they feed, they produce windows in the leaf, uh, which can look a wee bit like leaf mines, um, but without the frass. Usually you'll be able to see a small round circle um, on the underside of the leaf in this window and that indicates where the mouth part was clamped on sucking the chlorophyll out of the leaf. So why should we record them? Um, well just like most micromoths they're under-recorded, they're probably even more under-recorded than um, many other species which are more conventionally recorded by day or by light trap. So there's lots of scope to find species which are maybe new for a virus county or at the very least new for perhaps a 10k square. Um, it's also the, the best way to find and identify most of these species that are involved. Um, so most leaf miners, finding the adults is really difficult um, and identification of the adults is, is usually quite tricky and often requires dissection. So as an example, um, on the right is a, a map of the distribution of Stigmella assimilella, which is a um, gallery feeder on Aspen. Um, these maps can be found on the Easter Scotland uh, Butterfly Conservation Branch website. Um, I noted that there are no records in Fife where I live and do a lot of my recording. And so earlier this autumn, um, I went out, the knowledge that's been recorded both to the north and south of Fife, checked a few aspen, lo and behold, I found the distinctive mines of this species and was able to fill in a, a blank on the map. So what should you do with your records? Well, you can put them on iRecord um, and they should be picked up um, by uh, someone, probably a county moth recorder, who would uh, then validate the record and if it's proved acceptable, um, it would go on to the National Moth Recording Scheme. Or I would probably recommend um, actually contacting the county moth recorder directly um, to submit the records to them. Um, they may have some questions um, or require some kind of evidence to, to prove the record. 
Either way, the records once validated will end up in the National Moth Recording Scheme. So hopefully you've been suitably inspired. Um, and here are three species you can actually go out and look for now. So we'll start off with Phylodirecta emberiza pinella. So naturally it feeds on wild honeysuckle. Um, uh, I've never ever recorded it on wild honeysuckle, but it's very happy on snowberry and even more so on Himalayan honeysuckle, Lecisteria formosa. Both of these plants can be found in, um, in planted environments, urban areas usually, um, parks, gardens, retail parks, supermarket car parks. Um, I'd recommend looking for it on Himalayan honeysuckle because this species holds its leaves well into December, even into early January. What you're looking for is quite a large blister mine. Um, there's a lot of upper surface leaf deformation, especially once the larva has been feeding for a while, so it's quite easy to spot folds of the leaf. Turn it over and you'll find the large blister mine underneath with multiple creases. So that's one species you can look for. And two others, Femoria septembrella, which is uh, until recently known as Ectodemia septembrella. This feeds on uh, hypericums, so that's the St John's wort. Um, this particular um, image is on perforate St John's wort but it's equally happily on cultivated species as well, especially those that have the slightly smaller, narrower leaves. Again, these hold their leaves well into the winter. You're looking for a long, contorted, narrow gallery, which then opens out into a large blotch. Um, when you get colonies of them, they can be quite numerous. And finally, following to Leucographella, which is probably the easiest of the three to find. Um, in the wild, it will use apple and hawthorn, um, but actually it's most happy on cultivated pyracantha and cotoneaster, which almost every garden and uh, many sort of car park areas and things will have. It can be exceedingly numerous. I planted a pyracantha in our garden just a couple of years ago, and it now has hundreds of mines on it. Um, the main leaf there is a, a mine that's almost um, complete. Um, there, it's, it's an upper surface blister mine. Um, there's limited deformation, although it will fold the leaves upwards a little bit, um, especially in the older mines. And around you can see younger mines on pretty much every other leaf um, in the background there. So those are three species you can go out and look for now, as well as uh, species that form green islands, which we mentioned earlier. Um, that's everything I'm going to say today. Um, my email address is down there in the bottom left corner if anyone wants to contact me for um, more information. Um, I will hopefully be running a couple of field workshops uh, next autumn, which is a really great way to get out and learn a few bits and pieces. They will probably be uh, running in conjunction with Butterfly Conservation, so keep an eye on their websites for uh, their events section of their websites for information. I'll leave you with a picture of Phylonrichter lortella, um, a blister, mine, blister miner, which um, I read through to adulthood, and you can see how beautiful these uh, little leaf miners can actually be. Thank you very much.